Uh, the function of a small workshop is to keep alive and develop the best traditions of the craft, which are threatened by the age of mechanical standardization and uh, to preserve individuality with good workmanship, right? You know? We're losing the craftsman and craft. Uh, I like to leave two marks. Yeah, no, it's you know? wood after all. You want to feel that it's still yes. wood. I mean, that's the... But you get a crisper edge. Yeah. I mean, there's oh, no, no. You, you can't get away from the detail of that. Yeah. Right across behind this place uh, had been a fort. Uh, Daniel Boone settled in this area, right? And outside the fort was a spring, and uh, on the walls leading into the spring, which you had to go down to it, in this little cave uh, were pictographs, uh, Indian paintings. Mm -hmm. And a lick is a place where mineral salts come to the surface. So those pictographs were probably something to do with the hunting in the area. And so paint, lick. Oh, OK, makes so sense. So in this immediate area, there's blue lick and red lick and fall lick and slate lick and, you know, a lot of licks. So here we are in paint lick. So here that's, we are in paint lick. That's nice. But I stopped and bought this place only because of the strangeness of the name as I drove around the corner up here. Yeah, well, you know? it's, it's there it was, nice. you know, yeah. paint lick. It was just one of those odd... You well, know, let's take a look inside. So the Bodgers did this, you know, for the High Wycombe trade. And uh, Stuart King was one of the lads I worked with there. And uh, when we set up our Association of Polaise Turners in the 70s, slightly out of round, so I'm just taking it back to round again. Beautiful, beautiful. The reality of my work is that I'm a preservationist, and the technique and tradition to me is more important than the end product. The end product is a byproduct of what I do. So when I come to work in this shop, there's a pleasure of not having to turn out a million of something. Yeah. You know? Uh, I just put out a trestle table with a hand planed top ball cherry, you know, and this lovely detail of light bouncing off the top of that table. Is it you're replacing the legs on this chair here? I am, yeah. That's an old, that's yeah. an American uh, continuous arm Windsor. This looks pretty old. This had it some is. Yes, this worm been... into it for a while. Well, or do you they, think it was they upholstered, upholstered this one. Ah. You see, it had been upholstered, but it's definitely an old one. Uh, you can still see the, some of the turning marks in it, so, you know, it wasn't mass manufactured. And because it doesn't have a, the saddle, mm -hmm. uh, it had to have been upholstered. Does have the the groove around oh, the edge. Oh, you mean there. you're pretty sure that was manufactured to be upholstered in yes. the first place? Yeah, because otherwise you would have had. You see how flat right. this is across the front. Right. You would have had the pommel there in the middle. Right. If it had been, you know, meant to be hollow seated. So that would have made it a higher end chair, right? It would have been, yeah. Yeah, no, it's the, but it's nice detail, all the same. Look. It's a lovely chair, yes. It has a nice little, you know, molding around the mm -hmm. end there. So how old do you think that is, probably? Well, I'd say turn of the century, you know. Uh, eight, late 1800s. Now, it does have a, a maker stamp in the bottom. You know, it had had a, a label at one time, but... Uh, you can, t you can tell by the sprook here in the hole. See that tear out right mm -hmm. there and yeah. right there? That had to been done with a spoon bit. Oh. Because only a spoon bit would leave that raggedy cut in, the, in that grain, right? As it comes around, you know, it catches that end grain and has a tendency to tear. So, so you, you get a different kind of split out than you would get from a yeah. spurred auger bit? Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me get a scrap of wood and show you here. Yeah. So, if you're looking at the difference of it, you 
get a tear here and here. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, right. Right, because that it it doesn't have a spoon. It doesn't have a spur and like an auger. Right. And until it gets started, it doesn't have any centering device. Either, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you can use a, a, a gouge, a curved gouge, mm -hmm. you know, to to make a start. But normally, because it doesn't have a lead, you can change the angle after it's been established. Oh. Ah, okay, that's nice. Which is how we get right. these compound angles, right? Where if you start with an auger, that screw is going to keep it in that alignment. I'm really impressed by the niceness of this turning. It's a really bold turning. It comes down to like maybe you know, yes. five eighths of an inch there. But it's something that a lot of people probably would pass up or, you know, consign to the firebox. Alrighty, that's great that you can turn these. Did you turn these on the I turned those. Not on the pole lays. No. I do have power lays, you know. Uh, now, if I he wanted me to reproduce it, yep. I would have probably done the uh, pole lays because I can turn them just as slick and, you know. Do you, are these shoulder tenons in here? No, they don't no. seem to be. But you can see, here's the thing about the spoon bit again. Look at the end of this tenon here, right? You only find that rounded over where it's bulbous, you know, with a shallow shoulder. Yeah. When they do a dry green fit, right? So this had been done uh, out of so green So this is shrunk because of the drying of the leg? Yeah. Right. Well, this is turned that way on the lays so that when it goes into... Oh, so it locks itself. That so it's right. Mortis, right. right? It locks itself in because oh, this is right. wetter than this here. Right. Not, not exceptionally so, a few, you know, uh, a few degrees or so, but not much. The, the English style Windsor didn't have a tapered hole like these that used a reamer, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, the idea of the rounded end was that it had nest into the rounded bottom of the hole. And uh, these, those, these were never wedged? Or they those were never wedged, okay. no. Only wedged through the top, right? Okay, so the, the posts would come through and be wedged? Or? Yeah, these would be wedged. You can see the wedge right there. Going across this way. Mm -hmm. Right? And the, the, the legs were wedged from the top through the seat. But what we found out was that what made the Windsor so strong was that the legs were pushed under tension. Everything uh -huh. was pushed out. Right. Right? So, so you think the joints would come apart, right? No, it's actually just the opposite. <laughs> it's just the opposite because when this is under tension, yeah. everything's being pushed, right? So you can't pull that out of there. Once these are locked in, yeah. there's no way this comes out because you have that shrinking on the tenon. You have an extra length in here beyond what's supposed to be. And Michael Dunbar found this out by sitting on a chair at uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. And you could see where when he sat on it, the glue had failed and the joints started coming apart. You could see where the paint ended, uh -huh. right? Which meant that it was not compression or adhesion holding that chair, but it was the tension built up in the frame, right? So when I build my chairs, this is a, a set of bottoms for a Welsh chair. I do a sh slight shoulder here so that when I measure this distance, I add half an inch to it. So by the time I drive those legs in, you can see there's a bit of a space here right. and here. Right. We're forcing the leg, cranking the tenon. Right? And then on the Welsh chair, I actually run the stretcher right through and and lock then, it. Right. So now, there's no way they can pull out. You'd have to cut that off at the tenon to dismantle that. And because it starts with riven wood, then we got the strength. Right. So, do, so this is, these are legs in a flat seat, and oh, I see, and then you put the yeah. Top of the sepulchre. You see the, right. the yeah. wedges going. No, I haven't finished the dress right. up on these yet, you know? No, very handsome. So, a locked joint. Mm -hmm. 
So what do we have? We've got oak legs and this elms. Is elm elm seeds. Where do you get elm? Here, that's Around here, yeah, actually. Really? Yes. Um, the last elm tree I got fell down in a storm in uh, Lexington. A lot of urban foresters. That's where I get my elm. Yeah. Not in the yeah. wild anymore, yeah. but you know, city elm. Oh. Now here's a piece that came, that same fella that dragged those yeah. ewe legs dragged this piece of burr elm from Wales. Oh which will be a, a seat for the missus. She's going to get a rocking chair out of this one, you know? But look at the lovely bird natch, you know? Well, yeah, that's going to be... That'll a, be a... Yeah. Which is why people don't want to use elm too much, because it's raggedy stuff, you it's, know? But, but if you keep your tools sharp... Right, it's such a hard wood, lasts forever. You know? Yeah. Well, of course, that's what they used to make um, mill wheels out of. Yes, and, right. You know? And uh, the knaves of wagon wheels. Right. You know? But I still use the ads to hollow them. Now, of course, this has all that burr in it, so I'm going to have to keep changing direction. Spoke shave that, that smooths cleans up the hollow right. yeah. that the ads mark, and then this is a cabinet scraper in a body called a devil. So, with two of these, it does the finish cut. This is the, that tool making thing we were just talking about, you know. When I needed to make this tool, uh, I approached a blacksmith at a conference and he spent a day with me teaching me to make the irons, right, the proper way. Uh -huh. So to do it, he made, gave me a lesson plan. We did each stage of making it in a different piece of steel, drilled a hole in it and wired it together. So I'd always have that lesson plan available, you know, for uh, students right. or for myself or whatever. And I'm about worn this blade out, you see, but I've had it for 20 years. Wow. <laughs> right? So it's almost time to make another one. I gather and recondition a lot of old tools. I still use a stock knife and a fro. You know, this is a tine cutting tool when I'm building timber frames. I peg them together. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a cutter for making hay rake tines. Again, forged out of an axle in the back shop. Get in there. And it plonks out a half inch Look peg. At that. Perfect. Right. So by riving these, I can taper the end and draw pin the timbers together. And this is a stock knife for. trimming the peg. Clogging knife. Yeah, it's all very well. It was a time when, if you were eight years old and you got to do that all day long for 12 hours, yes. <laughs> you might not think it quite so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you get to use your broad axe? Actually, I'm about to use it again. Uh, I do, I'm doing a, a sing for a museum, uh, for the Portland Museum in Louisville, where restoring an old building there and they want me to do the the replacement timbers in the traditional way mm -hmm. so i'll use the that's a gilpin axe the second one there from england uh i'll use the broad axe to trim them up like that timber from here in this area so i mean i wouldn't build a whole house with it mind you but i do know how to use it and i can do it as an educational presentation. These people want me to do a program and apprentice some community people to 
uh, restore this building that had the timbers show those marks in it. So what we replace is going to have those tool marks. So I'm after the tradition. Yes, no. You know, keeping the tradition alive. 